Hi, everyone. This is Laszlo Montgomery, and welcome to the China History Podcast. Today, we're looking at one of the most well-known topics from Chinese history, well, here in the West, at least. Few topics have received so much interest from the masses as this one. People at least mildly familiar with Chinese history have all heard of the Opium War. Today, what I was hoping to do was offer a simple encapsulation of the history of this time. The Opium Wars, plural, took place between 1839 and 1842, and again between 1856 and 1860. China, at that time, seemed to be on an irreversible course to becoming the Dongya Bingfu, or the Sick Man of Asia. Qing Dynasty China in the 19th century was comparatively weak and no match for the Western nations who were benefiting from all the inventions and innovations of the Industrial Revolution that had been happening since the 1760s, not to mention from some of the byproducts of gunpowder that the Chinese invented. Even today, the memory of that humiliating period hangs over China in the 21st century like an angry ghost that hovers on many occasions and refuses to rest in peace. You don't see it, but for many, it's still there. The dead horse of these past humiliations that followed in the wake of the Opium War is still beaten today in the context of some of the hot-button issues where China feels slighted or disrespected by foreign nations, especially when America and Britain are concerned. The Opium War and the resulting treaties gave Chinese authorities a nice, bitter taste of the kinds of things foreigners were capable of. Despite the sordidness of it, the history of the Opium Wars is really quite a fascinating story. China today is a far cry from the weak giant of the mid-19th century. When you look at China's great achievements of the past few decades in the context of this so-called century of humiliation beginning in 1842, it's easy to understand some of the angrier words about a number of sensitive issues. China today, in all her glory, was hardly the China of the 1830s. Just like many Americans have this sense of American exceptionalism, well, way back in the day, China had the same feeling. China's Manchu Qing rulers up in Beijing truly believed their nation was the center of the world and everything, compared to them, was inferior. That's an oversimplification, of course, but it pretty much can sum up the prevailing attitude when China began to regularly interact with other nations or kingdoms. So you can imagine how poorly this was received when, in the early 18th century, these unwelcome British started poking their noses around and trying to weasel their way into the country to seek trade opportunities. You see, China had certain goods that Europeans just went crazy over. The big three were tea, silk, and porcelain. And of the big three, tea was really the big one. To this day, we refer to porcelain as China, with a small c, of course. Well, there wasn't anywhere else on the planet to get this stuff except the Middle Kingdom. And way back then... A lot of trade was exactly that. You traded the goods that your country was proficient at making for the goods that the trading partner specialized in. But Britain didn't have anything to offer China that they wanted. So without any kind of commodity or goods to exchange for tea, silk, and porcelain, they could only reach into their pockets and pay with silver. That's all China would accept. And that's how this whole thing really started. So let's go back in time to where the very seeds were planted. The first Westerners to gain a toehold in China were the Portuguese traders and missionaries who, back in 1557, were granted the tiny enclave of Macau. It's hard to look at little Portugal today as being such a great world power, but they were the real pioneers in navigation, and their navy kept the sea lanes along the Asian coast open for trade. The Chinese system back then, and actually up until modern times, was to control the foreigners by keeping them all in one place, far away from the capital in the north. So ceding Macau to the Portuguese was an old Chinese trick to make it easier to keep them in check. The authorities down there said, 
You're not allowed to go anywhere but this tiny place. And of course, if they defied the officials and wandered around Guangdong, they'd get noticed in a second, and the penalties were very severe if you got caught. You know, after Mao and the communists took control of China in 1949, they did the same thing. They couldn't simply stop all world trade with China, so they set up this system whereby they held this Canton Fair twice a year in the spring and autumn. And if you wanted to buy goods from China, you had to go to the Canton Fair to meet your China counterparts and conduct trade. Same as back in the pre-Opium War days. Keep the foreigners all in one area and watch them closely. Don't let them wander. The last dynasty of China, the Manchu Qing dynasty, by the time of the Opium War, was sort of at the midway point of the traditional dynastic cycle. They started off strong, a few good emperors with long and stable reigns, then not so great, and then by the time of the Opium War, their best days were already behind them. The greatest and most illustrious of Qing dynasty emperors, Kangxi, Yongzheng, Qianlong, were already dead and gone. China was in decline, but only relative to the Western powers who had, as I said, enjoyed all the benefits of this industrial great leap forward, if you will, and thanks to all the material wealth and knowledge brought about by the ages of exploration and discovery, the Enlightenment, and as I mentioned before, the Industrial Revolution that ran from the 1760s to the 1840s, when our story takes place. Unfortunately for China, they didn't know what was coming. For centuries on end, China's external enemies had always been to the West and the North. And these Central Asian tribes had always been the stone in the boot of the Chinese emperors and kings. Trying to keep these marauding tribes at bay had become sort of a specialty of China, and they were familiar with how to deal with these rough people from the Eurasian steppe. But the barbarians at the gate, now coming in droves to China's southern coast, were completely unfamiliar to the China court. The imperial court in Beijing still had the tributary system where, no matter who you were, how great, weak, or powerful, you were inferior to China. And if you wanted to have relations with the Middle Kingdom, you had to do it in the context of paying tribute to the emperor. This meant showing extreme respect and literally paying tribute, bringing gifts to the court and bowing to all the splendor and magnificence of the emperor and his court. So you can imagine by the 19th century when the West was on the rise and filled with all the confidence of their science, weaponry, new technologies, shipbuilding, and whatnot, when they dared to presume by their actions that they were equal to the Chinese, it evoked complete outrage and disbelief that these barbarians dared to think this way. Who were these guys? No one had ever done this before. There was this entity that I discussed in a two-part episode, CHP 195 and 196, that looks at the British East India Company. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. They had been around since December 31st, 1599, when Queen Elizabeth I granted a group of 218 merchants a monopoly for all trade in the East Indies. The immediate objective of the East India Company was to compete with the Dutch traders in breaking Portugal's monopoly on spices. Lots of blood spilled as everyone jockeyed for position and supremacy on the high seas. The English were trying to get a piece of the China trade, but the wily Portuguese, having a long head start on them, had been pretty successful in greasing the right palms in the south of China to keep the English out. They tried and tried to find all kinds of ways to break down the door and fan out across China to trade and all the great stuff China had. Chinese porcelain was all the rage in Europe, and both royalty and aristocrats in all the palaces and great estates just couldn't get enough of all these absolutely incredible and unique products that China had to offer. The Chinese had a general rule that on its simplest level said, If you want to trade with us, you can go to a place like Macau, and our representatives will meet with you there, and you can carry on your trade. So trade was very much restricted, and to exacerbate this whole 
inefficient and narrow system, the Western powers like Britain couldn't find anything made in England that the Chinese were interested to purchase in bulk. Finally, in 1685, the English caught a break and the Kangxi Emperor officially authorized foreign trade in a few ports in the South. Always the South. The imperial court never wanted these foreigners too far north. So this is how it was for almost 100 years. China traded silks, porcelain, medicines, and other luxury goods, all destined for the high-end markets, back in Europe where these goods were worn and used by the aristocracy and royalty. And this Canton system, put in place during Kangxi's time, slowly took shape, and all trade gravitated there, to Canton, or Guangzhou as it's known today. And this place became the center of all China trade, along with Macau. This Canton system that came about was the most corrupt and venal system you could think of. Everyone was on the take, and the Chinese officials just made fortunes skimming off the top and getting a piece of the increasingly larger and larger action. You had such characters as the Hapo, who served as the main administrator of Canton customs. He was fabulously rich. And reporting to the Hapo was the Kohong, or the Foreign Trade Guild in China. They were all in cahoots with each other, and the Hapo, together with the Kohong, did everything in their power to soak the foreigners and get as much out of them as possible. Hey, harbinger of what was to come in the early 1980s and 90s, I guess we could say, in uh, retrospect. Between the bribes that had to be paid and the high duties levied on goods, these guys were some of the richest men in China. The East India Company was at their mercy, and they weren't happy about it. Knowing it was futile to continue trying to work with the hopelessly corrupt and inefficient Canton system, the East India Company said, Let's go straight to the top. So someone sent a letter to the Qianlong Emperor himself, and these letters were referred to as memorials. So, in 1759, they sent their representative, Mr. James Flint, a Mandarin speaker, to bring the memorial to Tianjin. This was a port city about 80 miles southeast of the imperial capital in Beijing. The almighty Qianlong Emperor and his entire court were predictably outraged at these foreigners attempted to get around the Canton system that they had put in place. It was considered such an outlandish display of their ignorance of Chinese ways that they would dare petition the emperor directly, as if England and China were equals in the first place. Plus, back in those days, it was a big no-no to teach the foreigners the secret Mandarin Chinese language. That was a ploy to make sure that the Westerners were always beholden to the Chinese. Don't Let them learn the language. Flint got thrown in a Macanese prison for the contemptuous crime of addressing the emperor directly, and the Chinese language tutors were tracked down and executed. The Kohong merchants got a major dressing down, and Emperor Qianlong restricted all trade solely to Canton henceforth. All other ports were closed to official trade, although smuggling, of course, persisted. 1760 to 1833, if you wanted to trade with China, you had to do it in Canton. Any issues the European traders had, they couldn't appeal to any higher authorities. Everything had to go through the despised and corrupt Kohong. And believe me, if you had any gripes or had any issues with the system and appealed to the authorities, you had to write all these long, deferential, and extremely respectful letters, and it it was so tedious. The East India Company, with all their allies in government back in London, had sympathetic ears. The Earl of McCartney, no relation to Maka of the Beatles fame, was sent to Beijing in 1793, this time as an emissary from the court of St. James, rather than the East India Company. They figured they might get further this time sending representatives of a great nation rather than simply a corporation. The Earl of McCartney's Mission Impossible was to try and get the official relations between England and China on more equal footing. The whole mission, in no time at all, ended up getting bogged down in details and protocol. The Chinese, for example, were insisting that the Earl perform the mandatory kotao, or kotao, 
which in so many words involved bowing so reverently as to actually knock your head on the floor. Well, the Brits weren't going to do that. What would King George III say? So in short, nothing came out of the McCartney mission, and business as usual continued down in Canton. 23 years later, in 1816, they tried a second time to get around the system, this time sending Lord Amherst. But once again, it was high on theatrics and obfuscating and low on results. But by this time, tea was already the national beverage of England. And by 1800, tea purchases from China were four million pounds sterling. Tea was no longer just a luxury enjoyed by only the rich and powerful. Now the common people as well. They too love their cuppa. By this time, 5% of total household income of your average working stiff in England was spent on tea. So the East India Company really struck gold with tea. And they used opium grown in India to pay for the tea. And then the proceeds from the sale of tea went to service the company debt in London and provided a fabulous revenue stream for the crown. In fact, one-sixth of England's national revenue came from duties on tea. So even though opium was a sickening habit and a lot of people in Europe were morally opposed to it, the importance of opium in this whole unholy trading system was too critical and no one was going to get rid of it anytime soon. Commercial interests held sway over moral interests, so to speak. By 1815, the price of opium was lowered. This was for the top-grade Patna opium, not the lower-grade Chinese domestically produced stuff. This resulted in a flood of opium as prices fell. 1830, opium from Malwa, another part of India, was allowed into the market, further increasing supply. And then four years later, in 1834, the East India Company lost their monopoly, and the competition poured in, even further increasing the supply. By this time, opium had more or less become the basis for all trade and commerce with China. Demand for opium became so great that there wasn't enough tea in all of China to offset the opium demand. So what happened? The shoe was on the other foot now, and silver started pouring out of China. A couple boring statistics for you. In 1810, China enjoyed a favorable balance of trade with 26 million silver dollars coming into the country. 20 years later, in 1830, 34 million silver dollars were shipped out to pay for the opium. 34 million dollars might seem like chump change today, but back then, it was serious money. Opium was an extremely visible vice in China and had infected society no less than the heroin, opioids, crack, crystal meth had created havoc in our American society. Stories abound of addicts selling all their possessions or daughters just for their next pipeful. On top of all this, as silver became more and more scarce because of the trade imbalance, the exchange rate between copper coins and silver went badly against the peasants whose life was based on the lower-value copper coins. They still had to pay their taxes based on the silver rate, so they started getting wiped out too as their copper cash was worth less and less against the silver dollar. The Daoguang Emperor in Beijing and his advisors all tried to think of some way out of this disaster, even toying with the idea of legalizing the drug and controlling it this way but this would do nothing to deal with the bigger problem of addiction. So the fateful decision was made in December of 1838 to send an upright and honest official named Lin Zixu down to Canton to deal with this matter personally. Lin Zixu is considered one of the truly great heroes of modern China, mainly because he was both morally impeccable, politically brilliant, and incorruptible civil servant, and truly one of the great rising stars in China's imperial government at that time. But mostly, Lin is remembered as a brave Chinese hero who dared to stand up against the foreigners. But Lin Zixu was about as ignorant of the West as the next court official and had no idea what he was dealing with. He came up with a three-prong attack plan. First, 
to threaten all the addicts with severe penalties unless they went into rehab. Second, round up all drug dealers and punish them severely. And third, confiscate all the opium inventory held by the foreigners. In March 1839, Lin reached Canton and swiftly dealt with the first and second objectives. Addiction was dealt with, and such was the severity that Lin dealt with all the dealers and enablers of the opium trade, the market really began to contract. So Lin and his men were all high-fiving each other due to such early successes and thwarting the drug trade. He was a strict Confucianist, and he knew this trade was morally wrong and that the West surely recognized that selling this so-called foreign mud was completely reprehensible. Lin wrote his now famous Letter of Advice to Queen Victoria, where he tried to reason with the Queen about this. It's very long and quite fascinating. And if you Google Lin Zixu's Letter to Queen Victoria, you could find it. She never saw it, of course. <laughs> no way the powerful interests in England were going to allow anything to get in between the opium trade and their vested interests. The Western powers in these heady days, with all their new and powerful military technologies, viewed the Chinese, still mired in their ancient ways, with everyone being under the sun of heaven, and the Middle Kingdom, and this tributary system, and imposing non-negotiable high tariffs and protective customs barriers. It all seems so anachronistic in this new age of growing free trade and commerce. As I said, the East India Company lost their monopoly in 1834, and from that point forward, the opium trade just became a, a free-for-all. These were the days when merchants in England were fantasizing about 400 million Chinese adding an inch to the hem of their garments and thus keeping the looms of Manchester humming for years. So back to Lin Zixu. He thought with England so far away and all the foreigners sort of clustered down in one general area in and around Canton, that they'd see the error of their ways and they'd back down, and at last, this would spell the end of the opium trade. But he didn't consider the proximity of India to China. India was the perfect resupply base to fight a war. And with the Napoleonic Wars still somewhat fresh in everyone's mind, and the general consensus was that these Chinese and their 17th century weapons were going to be nothing compared to what the European powers now had in their arsenals. So Lin took advantage of England's most obvious weakness. They were outnumbered in a big way in Canton. And what followed was the great historic moment on March 24, 1839, when Lin Zixu demanded all foreign traders surrender their opium stocks. He offered some kind of compensation that led the major traders to believe that you know, if they just walked away from their inventory, it would be easy money. So the 350 or so European and American merchants listened to the advice of Captain Charles Elliott and surrendered their stocks of opium. Just like that, Lin Zixu gained an easy victory. On June 25th, over 24,000 chests of the drug were destroyed. That's 2.6 million pounds, or 1,300 tons. And they did this in a place called Holman Town. Anyway, the traders all skedaddled to Macau, but not before Lin Zixu made them all sign a bond, promising never to deal in opium again, and that if they did and got caught, they would be subject to the unforgiving Chinese laws. Captain Elliot refused to sign these bonds, so Lin just banned all foreign trade altogether. Elliot cooled his heels in Macau and waited for this, hopefully, tempest in a teapot to die down. The thinking was, if they waited it out, eh, maybe some new official more sympathetic to the traders would replace Commissioner Lin. Well, Macau wasn't the best place to hang out for the British because it was still Portuguese territory, and Lin did a little negotiating with the governor there and had them expel the English, which they happily did. So Captain Charles Elliot and the English set sail for a group of rocky islands just to the east of Macau at the mouth of the Pearl River. And on September 4th, 1839, they landed somewhere on the Kowloon Peninsula to seek water and supplies. 
Chinese vessels anchored there prevented Elliot's party from landing and taking on supplies, using the good old tried-and-true method of agonizing obfuscation. So Elliot fired on the two Chinese vessels, and a fight ensued, but Elliot ran out of ammo, and the British vessels fled. And that was the opening salvo of the Opium War. There was no turning back now. This whole incident didn't sit well back in London. Good old Henry John Temple, the third Viscount Palmerston, known in history as Lord Palmerston, aided and abetted by a chap named Dr. William Jardine of Jardine Matheson and Company, used this action by the Chinese as a casus belli. Jardine and his company, by the way, was the firm that novelist James Clavell modeled his characters Dirk Struan and Struans and Company on. They were also referred to as the Noble House, which was the sequel to Clavel's novel, Taipan. Anyways, Jardine and Lord Palmerston were looking for six things. One, moderate and fixed tariffs. Two, diplomatic equality with China. Three, a territorial base near China from which to carry on trade. Four, new ports besides Canton from which to trade with. Five, extraterritoriality. And last, an indemnity for all the opium destroyed on Lin Shu's orders. Again, it wasn't so easy to send the British Navy to go fight this battle. There actually were a lot of bleeding-heart liberals and religious folk in England who were very much against anything that had to do with perpetuating the opium trade. Missionaries had been bringing back horror stories for years about fathers selling their daughters to get their next fix and all the usual things associated with the depraved lifestyles of drug addicts. But just as it always does, even in our day, economics and financial interests prevailed and Lord Palmerston ordered the Admiralty to send a naval expedition to China. The Opium War started off under Captain Elliot, who quickly won a string of victories. He sailed north to Tianjin, which was a little too close for comfort for the imperial court in Beijing. They had been receiving reports from Canton saying, you know, in so many words, that, hey, don't worry, everything was under control. But yet, there were British forces already 80 miles away from Beijing. Lin Zixu had to take a bullet for this, and he was kicked out and exiled to Xinjiang a new commissioner took his place, named Qi Shan. And it was left up to Qi Shan to negotiate a peace with the British. And he did so, and signed the Convention of Chuan Bi in January 1841. This treaty ceded those barren rocks that Elliot had retreated to after being kicked out of Macau back in 1839. And this sparsely populated group of islands, of course, was Hong Kong. Believe it or not, Elliot was stripped of his command for bargaining for an indemnity of only six million dollars, one million of which was payable at once, and the balance in equal installments ending in 1846. But mostly, Lord Palmerston couldn't accept that all he got was this useless territory that he famously derided as, quote, a barren island with hardly a house upon it. Hey, who knew? Henry Pottinger was then appointed as Elliot's replacement as plenipotentiary in May 1841. Qi Shan didn't fare much better, and his career took a turn for the worse when the Daoguang Emperor had him brought back to Beijing in chains for having the audacity to cede Chinese territory to a foreign power. He was stripped of his fortune and utterly disgraced. He made a comeback after some time, but he really felt the wrath of the imperial court over the terms of the Convention of Chuan Bi, which incidentally was accepted neither by the emperor nor by Lord Palmerston. With Pottinger, the second phase of the war began. This one was a lot more violent and involved a plan to split China in half conveniently at the Yangtze River. This third longest river in the world bisects China in half, stretching from the Himalayas and emptying out into the East China Sea at Shanghai. The idea was to cut the north off from all the tribute grain shipments from Central and South China. Pottinger sailed north up the coast, and the British forces took Ningbo just south of Shanghai. And then he proceeded to sail up the Yangtze, 
and got as far as the old Ming Dynasty imperial capital of Nanjing. The Chinese military thought that once the British were on land, they'd have some sort of a home field advantage. But it was nothing of the sort. The British had the latest in military technologies, which in those days amounted to percussion lock muskets, heavy artillery like cannons, and paddle wheel gunboats. By the summer of 1842, the Yangtze was a British controlled river, and Nanjing was about to be blown to smithereens. Nanjing, being the former capital and all, was simply too symbolic a place to lose. To the Daoguang Emperor, that would be tantamount to losing the mandate of heaven, so they had to sue for peace. And thus, we get the infamous Treaty of Nanjing, signed August 29, 1842, a date that the Chinese will forever hold in infamy. This was the first of many Bu Ping Deng Tiao Yue, or unequal treaties that were more or less rammed down the throats of the Chinese. The terms of the treaty were as follows. Hong Kong was ceded in perpetuity to the Chinese, although they ended up getting it back anyway, 155 years later. And I was living in Hong Kong at the time and watched the handover on TV. Next, five new treaty ports were opened at Canton, Xiamen, or Amoy as it was called back then, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai. The Western powers would later send consuls, businessmen, and missionaries to all these places. A 21 million silver dollar indemnity was to be paid to the British crown. The Kohong monopoly was abolished. Moderate tariffs and inland transit duties were established. Foreign officials were diplomatically equal to Chinese officials. No more of this tributary nonsense. The Chinese now had to deal with these barbarians as equals. The Western powers got extraterritorial rights, and last, the most favored nation practice was adopted. And so ended a sad period in Chinese history. Afterwards, well, it was a slow and steady decline for China, and they missed the bus time and again as attempts were made over the subsequent decades to strengthen the country in the face of Western domination. Throughout the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, China would be racked with wars and rebellions that made reforming impossible. One of the conditions of the Treaty of Nanjing was that it had to be renegotiated in 12 years. And when they came back to the well to extract even more concessions from China than up to its ears in the Taiping Rebellion, well, this resulted in the Second Opium War. And I welcome you to scroll ahead to that five-part series covering the Taiping Rebellion to find out more about the details surrounding this event from 1856 to 1860. That's in CHP episodes 280 to 284. So, this was your easy-to-digest summary of the First Opium War. That's going to be it for this time. May I cordially invite you to visit the official website at tcop.media. There you can find all the Chinese terms from every CHP episode to refer to, as well as ways to support me and my humble efforts to bring you these podcast episodes. This is Laszlo Montgomery once again signing off and wishing you a fond farewell from this wonderful Southern California town of Los Angeles, California. I cordially invite you to visit with me again for what's already shaping up to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.